Welcome back to the TMDSAS podcast, where we'll explore the TMDSAS application in greater detail by connecting you, the applicant, with the admissions experts who are ready to help. I'm your host, Enrique Hasso, Coordinator of Research, Advising Services, and Digital Media at the Texas Health Education Service in the TMDSAS office in Austin, Texas. Today we are at the Dell Medical School at the UT Austin campus. We're joined by Mr. Joel Debo. Mr. Debo, thank you very much for taking the time to talk to with us. Uh, Enrique, it's my pleasure, and, and first and foremost, it's Joel, please. Oh. <laughs> All right, Joel, thank you. Well, um, we're going to ask you a series of questions that we've been uh, we've been asking several people at the other medical schools, and obviously at Dell, it's one of the new kids on the block, so we want to make sure that we get as much information to applicants as possible. So first off, uh, a little bit about yourself. Would you mind telling us about your academic background? So uh, I have an academic background in, in business and a little bit of uh, I have a certification in engineering as well. But my primary background is uh, in marketing and research, uh, primarily in uh, looking at in my graduate work algorithms that make, make sense of metadata or large amounts of data. And so that was my background. Uh, and it's something that actually in, in, in a very interesting way I use every day in my uh, in my career. I should also note that we are next to the hospital, and so we probably will hear ambulances as they run by. It's an active area. <laughs> <laughs> Would you mind telling us what your experiences are and where you came from before you were here? Mm-hmm. So I, I, I have worked in higher education now for 28 years, and uh, a big part of that was at the undergraduate uh, uh, level at the University of North Texas in Denton. And then about... Oh, I guess it's been about 12 uh, years ago or so. I started uh, and and went to the University of Texas, uh, University of North Texas at um, Fort Worth Health Science Center and worked at the Texas College of Osteopathic Medicine and had been there for probably about 12 years um, and had a, a real pleasure working with uh, the faculty and staff there and developed a team that uh, really, I think, addressed what our mission was and, and uh, were not only attentive to students, but also to uh, the mission of the institution. And so I, uh, after, after having the pleasure of doing that and, and really thinking about what I wanted to do next, uh, and not necessarily thinking about Dell Medical School um, in a, an interesting, serendipitous way, it's how things happen, mm-hmm. was having a conversation with somebody who was just recently um, hired by Dell Medical School and talking about process and what we had been able to accomplish uh, with our process management system. And In the course of that conversation, uh, talked about um, what you know, what were the needs, and what would be the needs of a new medical school. And then uh, after that, got a got a query about coming down and visiting. And so I came down to visit and learn more about what was happening down here. Had heard a lot about what was in the press, but not really uh, didn't really get a good sense of what truly the mission of Dell Medical School was. And after that that visit and that opportunity. I really became enamored with this idea of starting something from scratch that's that is really intended to and is intending to uh, tackle some of the major problems that that I faced and have seen in healthcare and um, in, in unique and novel ways and, and ways that I think are actually going to be sustainable as well. So that really attracted me to the mission of Dell, and I felt like I had gotten my uh, other office to a point where it was. Um, well-staffed and, and a good position for me to transition, and so I took the opportunity. Of course, and uh, everybody always speaks volumes to how great Austin is. Well, I, I certainly didn't move down here for the affordable housing or the or the clear thoroughfares. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, Austin really wasn't my destination place. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, we really, really loved Fort Worth a great deal. Um, however, the opportunity to, to work with, uh, with Dell Medical School was just too great. And so we are learning to love Austin, uh, which we are every day, um, uh, learning more and more about the city and about the community. Yeah. Uh, Austin is a unique community, and we'll probably talk more about this in a little bit, but it, it is actually probably the only community in Texas in which this kind of experiment could really work uh, for a lot of reasons, and not necessarily for the best reasons. Um, Austin is the most economically uh, segregated community of, of its size in, in the United States. And so there are some unique challenges this community faces. Um, and so Austin presents a lot of opportunities. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's, it's, it's also a lot of uh, fun because it's a very vibrant community, but there are also a lot of opportunities for change. Well, that's a great segue into 
uh, learning a little bit about what makes this institution so unique. Uh, I know there, there are a lot, of, a lot of different moving parts that came into play at just the right time to establish this medical school. So uh, could you tell us how those contributed to what makes Dell Medical School so unique? So I think you first have to know a little bit about how um, and why Dell Medical School was created. Um, the first thing you have to go back quite a bit into our Texas history to know that constitutionally, um, the medical school was designated as being located at Galveston and that the undergraduate institution was designated to, to be in Austin. And so we really didn't uh, have a mechanism for creating a medical school in Austin for many years because it really was viewed as uh, the services provided by um, the other health science centers. But as everybody knows, Austin grew dramatically in just the last 20 years. And so it became obvious that this community was the, the largest community besides without a, without a health science center or without a medical school. And a medical school brings a great deal to a community, both in research and in, in clinical care, as well as an incubator for ideas and economic development. And so the community recognized that there was really a need to have a medical school in Austin. And so through a complex series of activities involving um, Senator Kurt Watson and other leaders of this community, uh, there was a proposition to uh, raise taxes in Austin to help pay for the medical school. And I think it's a really important point because it makes Austin, the city of Austin and the county of Travis, our primary mission. It is interwoven into our DNA in a way that affects every decision that we make. Uh, the community here has an expectation that we are going to improve the health care for this community. In fact, I think we will, uh, in our effort, our mission will actually become an example for the rest of the nation of how to develop and implement solutions for a model healthy city. But it means also that we are accountable in a way that most medical centers are not. And I think that's very refreshing. It, it's challenging. But I think the fact that we have to account for what we're doing every day makes us very diligent uh, and, and good stewards of uh, the resources that we have. And we do need to demonstrate that we can affect change in this community the way we think we can. And so that means that, that there's a lot of activity always happening here. Mm-hmm. Um, so we've also attracted, as a result of this partnership, a lot of talent from across the country. We have national and actually international experts in many areas who are, who are very attracted to the idea of changing healthcare as we know it. And that's really what our mission has become, is to rethink how we deliver care. We believe that there are some fundamental problems with the healthcare delivery system in the United States, one that its costs uh, are, are going up and the quality or value is going down. And so when we start talking about value in healthcare, we're talking about the benefit to the patient as a ratio to the cost to the patient and to society, and how do you generate great value. Um, so we have a lot of people who have been attracted to Dell Medical School uh, for that reason, and so that's also been terribly exciting to, to, to you know, bump into people in meetings who I've read about in articles um, or have seen their books in publication. Um, so the, the first thing is to think about how the school was started, and then secondly, its mission, which is to make Austin a model healthy city. And also to do that through developing the future physician leaders who are going to make those changes. And so we looked at medical education and said, we don't have any institutional history to change, which is a, it's really a blessing because yes. it's like changing the direction of a battleship. Mm-hmm. It's not something that turns overnight. overnight. Mm-hmm. Uh, so having no direction that's already been established, it gave us an opportunity to kind of wipe the slate clean and think about how we train uh, future physician leaders. And uh, if you take the time to look at the literature about um, after Flexner, the, the AAMC report about rethinking uh, Flexner's model for education, which we've all become familiar with over the last hundred years, which is two years of didactic education and two years of apprenticeship education or, or mentorship or, or clerkship. And to really say, is that is that truly developing the next uh, generation physician? So we looked at our curriculum and we and we said, let's, Rethink how we train these future physicians, and that's probably from a student's perspective the most novel aspect about Dell Medical School. So the first thing that you'll notice is that instead of two years of uh, basic science instruction, we have a 12-month basic science instruction. It's an accelerated curriculum, 
And it's a curriculum that's not just compressed, but it's taught in a more of an adult learning manner. So it is taught in what's called a flipped classroom. And the flipped classroom is all about knowledge application. Uh, it's the next level of maturation in education and development uh, from knowledge acquisition. And most of our students out there already are very good at knowledge acquisition. You, you've done that and you've demonstrated the ability to do so in your undergraduate classes. Now the expectation is that you're going to um, develop and, and acquire that knowledge outside the classroom. And then when you're in the classroom, you're going to be applying that knowledge. And so we're, we believe we're able to move clinicians or future clinicians to the point where they're prepared to not only um, have the understanding of the basic human physiology and, and pharmacology and basic uh, sciences to understand the disease process, but also to do well on, on the board exams, which are designed to, to protect the public and to identify that you have that knowledge. Um, but we think we can do it in a way that creates physicians who are critical thinkers early on as opposed to them developing those skills later in clerkship and in residency. And so that's that's the first year, which then opens up our, and there's a lot more I can go into detail. I don't think your listeners have time to listen to the whole, uh, the whole theory behind the flipped classroom, but uh, there's more information on our website about mm-hmm. it. Which then opens up our second year, and I think this is this is terribly exciting, and, and it is a, a, a something that we're about to transition to is our first year medical students finish their first year of medical school and will begin training in our new teaching hospital across the street in their second year. So our second year students actually will start their core clinical rotations during the we'll do it in their second year. Mm-hmm. Traditionally, that's in your third year. And there's a lot of research out there that suggests that starting clinical activity before you do your step one actually demonstrates a better performance in step one. And so uh, we anticipate that that's going to occur. We also still have integrated curriculum that will connect with the second year um, curriculum as they're in their clerkships. They will also be um, getting some additional basic science uh, instruction through our intercessions and is through our other tools that we utilize to, to monitor their knowledge acquisition. Mm. So that's also a, a brief explanation. I'm not sure how much time I have to continue talking about. Oh, we can definitely keep talking. Okay. About All right. <laughs> so that opens up our third year for something that I think is, um, is really exciting. And I believe really addresses what we're attempting to do, which is to give our future physicians skills that they're going to need to be successful mm-hmm. uh, and to be those thought leaders, those change agents in healthcare for the future. And so in their third year, they can do two, one of two things. They can pursue a dual degree or they can pursue a project in the domain of innovation and discovery. So the first, the dual degree. So we're, we're UT Austin and we have uh, as part of this family of, of uh, programs and schools, a lot of uh, exceptional programs in which our students can pursue a dual degree in. They can choose to do an MBA at the McComb School of Business. They can uh, pursue a, a Master's of Biomedical Engineering at the Cockrell School of Engineering. They can pursue a public health degree, a Master's of Public Health at the UT School of Public Health. Or they can pursue a Master's of Education in Psych uh, in the Department of Education. And that last one's particularly relevant if you plan on going into uh, academic medicine, because it really is about academic uh, education and theory of education. So that uh, is all accomplished in a nine-month period of time. So there isn't any overlap. You're not going to be working on uh, courses in your second year to get into the third year or in your fourth year to complete your, your dual degree. And you don't sacrifice any of your electives or selective uh, clerkship activity to, in order to get enough hours in that degree program. So we think that you can get that completely done in nine months. In fact, if you can manage our, our first year curriculum, you can, mm-hmm. you can manage that curriculum. And so that's one opportunity. The other opportunity is to engage in a project, a substantive project over a nine month period of time in which it meets the mission of the institution, uh, in the domains of either population health, in, uh, innovation, translational research, um, or, um, uh, I'm sorry, population clinical research or innovation. And it it really is um, designed to give our students an opportunity to examine the community at large and see where there is an opportunity to uh, do something that is sustainable and scalable and meets the mission of making Austin a model healthy city. And that could be anything from uh, innovation and technology. It could be policy change. It could be process improvement. It could be community engagement. Um, 
but it's something of such a substantive nature that at the end of that project, the student is going to become the de facto expert in that area uh, and should be able to demonstrate to uh, other communities that this is something that is uh, effective in improving the health of the community. Mm -hmm. and, and like I said, it could be everything from uh, developing new technologies to implementing process improvements in community clinics that result in, in you know, enormous outcomes or improvements in certain areas. It'll be up to the students to identify that um, what that project will be. It'll be juried and it'll be evaluated to make sure that it's something of, of substantive nature. Uh, resources may need to be identified for it. There could be collaboration between venture capital or with researchers on campus or, or policymakers in our community. Um, and they'll be collaborating with our design institute. And our design institute is a collaboration between Dell Medical School and uh, the School of Design at UT. And we hired away from uh, the premier uh, design company in the United States, IDEA, IDEO, sorry, uh, two of the premier health uh, design experts in, in the United States. And they are experts on design and development of uh, uh, implementing solutions for either whether it's a, a handheld device or a process improvement or a clinic. Mm -hmm. But the process of what you think through and go through to develop good design is the same. And so they're going to train our students on how to do that. How do you go through and, and effectively design and implement rapidly change rapidly you know things that rapidly fail go back and implement new ideas how do you progressively take something through to a process where you design something that is effective and so it's there are two things that are going to happen in that project one is our students are going to become um, an advocate and an expert in a particular area of identified need but also they're going to develop tools in design and quality improvement that will be unlike probably most of their peers. Right. And so they'll be able to carry that with them into their graduate medical education. That's really neat. Uh, I think, too, that, that uh, our students will identify graduate medical education programs that have a focus in the area that they're interested in. Mm -hmm. So, yes, it might be internal medicine, but an internal medicine program in an urban community that might be developing an ACE unit for, for geriatric care, for instance. And so they'll, they'll be looking for those kinds of opportunities that really fit into the, what their passions are about. Um, so the third year, I think, is, is, is the most novel aspect uh, of our curriculum, and the opportunity there to do something of, of uh, exceptional merit to, um, to develop yourself further beyond just and it's, just, it's hard to say just, but you know, to, to not only have the skills to be a good clinician, but also to develop additional skills to make you a future leader. The first class coming into that curriculum won't happen until fall 2018, is that right? So, well, so yes. So, so they, on um, fall 2017, are starting their, uh, their clerkships. But during that period of time, uh, they will be engaging the community to identify needs and looking at different opportunities as they develop their ideas. So when they start their third year, that idea should already be pretty fleshed out. Mm -hmm. And so they are, are will begin that discovery process. Some have already started <laughs> that discovery <laughs> process now. Uh, but they will begin that discovery process as they move into the, through their second year. And part of that, something I didn't get a chance to mention, is the primary care clerkship that they will do uh, in their second and third year is a continuity clinic in which they're in the entire year. And it's a, it's a community care clinic. They're at the same clinic, same patient panel. So they're seeing not only how to diagnose in that acute visit, but also how to manage the care follow-up and see that patient progress. These clinics are also often parts of the community that are underserved, and so they'll also be able to see a great deal of disparity in this process. And when they move into their second semester of their second year, they will also start to go out and visit with community organizations in that day that they're scheduled for clinic to see what other needs are available. So they'll start to see opportunities and what really fits into what they're interested in pursuing. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're doing a dual degree, you still can be engaged in a project. It just won't be to the same level as somebody who's in the project. So you may be tasked as a team member if you're an MBA student, to help develop a, a business plan. Mm -hmm. Now, that'll, that'll feed into your capstone project as the MBA program, but it also help support a team who's putting together a relatively large project. Yeah. Um, then fourth year is pretty typical. That's, uh, that's really more about discovery, going out and doing away rotations, mm -hmm. uh, applying for residencies, and uh, it, that's where we begin to interface with the ACGME programs, and so that's what's, what's a little more traditional. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, that's 
really great to hear how all of the different aspects that came together to establish Dell really fed into the school's mission and how effectively the curriculum will in turn connect that mission to actual application in the community and, and to all of its students. Since you've sold the school so well at this point, uh, can, you to get, uh, can you give us a little bit of feedback on what applicants can do to stand up uh, in the eyes of the admissions committee for Dell? So uh, I think you hit on a couple of key things in your, in your last comment about mission. Everything is really driven based on the mission. And if you have the mission in mind, then everything else kind of falls into place. What we're truly trying to identify are individuals who already have this passion motivation, these skills that we're going to build upon. Mm. And so it is very much um, in the same vein as we look at academic preparation and we're going to build upon that. We also look at uh, development in the domains of innovation, leadership, and community engagement because we will build upon that as well. So um, it, it is really the selection process as we look at an application is really driven by that that concept, the idea of a mission approach towards selection. So when we consider a candidate, we, we break them up into two, two major domains, a cognitive and non-cognitive domain. It's, it's not unfamiliar probably to most of your candidates. But mm -hmm. one, because we are an accelerated curriculum, there is an expectation of a certain amount of competency in the basic sciences before you start because we do not have the opportunity really to, to bring somebody up to speed if they have not yet acquired that knowledge that they need to have to be successful. Mm -hmm. So... The best indication of future success or future future performance is really past performance. And so we look at the entirety of the applicant's record academically. We look at trends. We look for upward trends. We look for graduate work. We look at uh, rigor. We look at obligations. Uh, somebody who is obligated to play sports doesn't have necessarily enough time, a lot of time to do other things. How did they do in that context? Or if they're having to care for a family, how do they do in that context? But again, try to identify the candidates that we believe will be successful in our curriculum. So that's one, one domain, one bucket. If you draw a big circle and put everybody in that circle uh, who can, can meet the academic rigor. Mm -hmm. You draw an overlapping circle on that, and that is the non-cognitive or mission side. And that really is looking at people who have, have had exceptional activity in the areas of innovation, leadership, and community engagement and try to see what they've done throughout their, their undergraduate experience or post-undergraduate experience that really speaks to those elements, something that they've been passionate about, something that is that's substantive. Um, one of the things that I, I try to advise pre-meds about is that it's not the number of activities that you're involved in, mm -hmm. uh, because sometimes it looks a little bit like a laundry list of things that you've done. Yeah. Uh, one hour here, two hours here, three hours there, and, and in the hopes that in the aggregate that's, how much community service or leadership you're looking for. It could be one singular activity, but it's such, such a substantive nature that it's very meaningful. So it's about what did you do? What was your passion? So where those two circles overlap, that is really the spot that we're looking for. Mm -hmm. So there are candidates with a 99 percentile MCAT and a 4.0 GPA who don't fit into that category, who we would not necessarily feel would be a good mission fit. There are other candidates who spent the last four years, for example, in the Peace Corps, uh, drilling wells for communities that didn't have fresh water. Excellent mission fit, but they have not uh, demonstrated competency in the basic sciences, and they wouldn't right. fit in that domain as well. So it's really striking a balance of, of the people who have identified strengths in the areas that we're going to build upon, mm -hmm. both in the academic domain and in our mission domain. Great. I think that's really great insight for a lot of our applicants in uh, a lot of the advisors that listen in, thank you very much for sharing that. So now uh, we're going to head into our fun question. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's it's our Mythbusters question where uh, we give you the opportunity to think of a common myth that you hear and get to flip it and provide the correct advice. Mm -hmm. So uh, can you tell us what your favorite myth is and what the correct advice is? Oh, there are so many. Um, <laughs> Can I tackle two of them? Yes, you can. So let me start with um, the the first one is that we don't read the letters of recommendation. Uh, I, I, that is solely false, uh, wholly false, I should say. It's, it is it is a um, something that we dig into and read every single line in all the applications, including the letters of recommendation. And 
Part of it is what does the person say about you, and how、uh, well do they know you. But also the other part of the evaluation is how did you decide who was going to write your letters for you,、mm-hmm. and did you put much thought into it? Sometimes individuals will say, "Well, I made an A in that class, so therefore this person can write a great letter for me." And, and the letter reads something to this extent: it says,、uh, "Student X was in my class. They made an A, so they must be a very good student." Now let me spend the next three paragraphs telling you about what I do and what kind of research I do.、Yeah. It really is not very insightful whatsoever into the student.、Uh, but another letter from somebody who maybe made a B in a class, but the faculty member talks about how the student failed the first test and and. Recognized the weakness and came to them and worked with them every day and had an intellectual curiosity that really was about understanding the material and strived to to learn the material and did even though that they improved they weren't able to get over a B because of the first test but it really spoke to somebody about about somebody's resilience and and their intellectual curiosity、mm. that's much more telling to us than. The general, they made an A、right. uh, letter. So, so that's the first one that that we truly do、uh, read the entire application.、Um, and and in addition to that,、uh, please make sure that that your essays are not only accurately or are answering the question, but that they are grammatically correct. Yes.、Uh, that you did take the time to to proofread it, or have somebody else proofread it, make sure that edits that you had made or thought you made are really there. Uh, it's difficult to argue that that I truly want to join this profession when you didn't take enough time to really fill out the application well, and that includes looking at how many hours you spent on on projects or describing what you did or even using the optional essay to tell more about your story.、Mm-hmm. Uh, failure to do that really suggests a, a lack of of、um, a lack of, of thoroughness to, to to put it quite bluntly, putting the, the effort into the application,、yes. the most important application you're ever going to fill out. So that's one myth. The second myth:、um, I don't know who Lizzie M is,、uh, but I don't care what score she has,、mm-hmm. and、uh, and please quit trying to figure out what our Lizzie M score is because there's no such thing. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. There's this idea somewhere that there's this formula.、Uh, there is for us no formula.、Um, there, it really is about the content of the application. It's about a holistic review.、Uh, it is about、uh, trend information. It's about Uh, accomplishments. It's about mission fit.、Mm-hmm. We get、uh, close to five thousand applications a year, and we have three hundred and fifty spots to select for interview. What we're trying to do in that process is, on balance, find those individuals who we think would best fit the mission of Dell Medical School. On the interview day, we further discern you know, who really,、uh, through their essay, through their essays and their application. Uh, can express why they think that they're a good fit for us, and and how their the mission of Dell Medical School fits what they desire to do. But they also are looking at us to see if this is a place they want to go to school as well.、Right. And so that's not always the best fit for everybody, and they recognize that. So that's that's really what the interview day is for.、Mm-hmm. Um, so that's what we're trying to discern in our evaluation as we read the entire application: is you know, does the person have the capacity to do well in our accelerated、uh, curriculum? And meeting that threshold, the ability to to do the work, then are they a good fit as far as what we're attempting to do in our mission at Dell Medical School? Wonderful. I think those are some really great myths that you just tackled, and、um, something that's been really incredible on my end is you know we've asked that question of everybody we've talked to. I've yet to hear a re-、uh, repeated myth. Oh, <laughs> so that tells you something about how many myths there are out there. <laughs> well, can I can I make one recommendation if people are continuing to listen and, and we haven't lost them yet?、Uh, you know, please don't be afraid to call the admissions office if you have a question.、Mm-hmm. Uh, I think it's much better for you to get the information. Now, there are not always、uh, we are not always able to answer your question based on procedure、uh, or where we are in the process. But we will tell you that that this is where、uh, you are in the process. We can't answer that part of the question, but we certainly will answer questions that we can to make sure you have the correct information.、Uh, I think that 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 is much wiser to proceed on than on rumor or on speculation. Now, having said that, you don't want to、uh, keep calling admissions offices with the same question and demonstrating that you have not yet picked up on what the answer is.、Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm not espousing that, but I think that. Uh, you certainly want to get the information uh, correct, uh, get the correct information, and I, I can tell you that every admissions office in the state wants to answer those questions for you,、uh, so that you are working with the correct information. Right. 
Well, thank you very much for all the feedback you've given us. Is there anything else you'd like to share with applicants and advisors before we let you go? Um, so I think that that you really need to do a self-evaluation on what you're looking for. I think Dell Medical School is unique enough that it's not the best fit for everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a lot of expectation that you are um, a motivated learner where you can go out and gather information external to the classroom and that uh, most of everything we do is in small teams. So if, if you don't like working in teams, and that's an important understanding to have of yourself, uh, then this may not be the best environment uh, for, for you to be successful. And also there's an expectation that you're going to get engaged in uh, in the areas of leadership, innovation, and community engagement. It's, it's not necessary to, uh, to take these types of courses in order to become a good clinician. Um, and so if that's your sole, not sole, but that's your primary goal, then you may see a lot of this work that we do as superfluous to what your goal is. Mm -hmm. And so you really have to have a, um, an interest in what we're trying to do here to, to, to uh, really thrive. So be sure that it's the right place for you. Yeah. Well, Joel, uh, really thank you for your time and, uh, for sharing all your insight with the applicants. Absolutely. It was my pleasure with you. Make sure you subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you listen to podcasts to stay up to date with us. Follow us on Facebook at facebook.com slash TMDSAS and at Twitter at TMDSAS and at TMDSAS Support. On behalf of TMDSAS, we want to wish all our applicants for the 2018 cycle all the best of luck. Thank you very much for listening. We'll talk to you later.